but I won't put it down. Politics. Oh, okay. Well, what we're going to talk about today is the sheriff's office and what we're doing to help save you money. And when we get started, one of the things I have to give is a compliment to my sheriff, because my sheriff is an innovator. But better than that, he allows others to innovate. He lets you do a lot of broken field running. He lets you seize opportunities when you see them. And you know, part of the way that this system works is because the structure is set up to allow it to work. Because we think that the way to do things, and you'll see that, is ideas can come from the top down, and that's true, and ideas can come from the bottom up. And that's also true. And sometimes those ideas from the bottom up are the best ideas, because that's coming from the people who are actually doing the tasks. And they see things because they're down in the details that I don't see because I'm not down in the details as much. Really what the challenge was that we had was the revenue shortfalls that came up. Not this last budget year, but the one before, we had a $3.2 million shortfall for the office of the sheriff. Now the sheriff's office receives its funding from two places primarily, city and the state government. And it's about a 60-40 split. City, city government gives us about 60%, give or take, and state government gives us about 40% to run the office of the sheriff. And so what we had when we were confronted with these shortfalls was we had to make up these shortfalls, and we didn't want to ask for any more money. We didn't want to ask for any more taxpayer money if we could do it. That's what we were up to. And we also wanted to assist the city because they had revenue shortfalls and trying to meet their obligations to you, too, in any way that we can. One of the things that you may remember is we took a million dollars out of our special revenue fund, our surplus account. Monies, still public monies, but monies that we did not spend, we gave it to the city to help them balance their budget. But I really want to let you know before we get started, the only reason this all works is because of the great staff we have there. We have a bunch of great deputies that work there every day protecting you. And you probably don't see a lot of the work they do because unlike our brothers on the police department, they're not out here in the public as much. You see them occasionally in courts and things like that, but you don't really see them in their day-to-day -day activities, which is why I would encourage you next month to come when we have our meeting at the jail because you'll see a lot of our deputies doing what they do. And they work very hard. We, we, we are about 19 deputies short of our authorized strength. We always have, like everyone, we have trouble recruiting people, recruiting the right people. And in addition to that, we've had some budget cuts that uh, took away some of the staff. And in addition to that, even before all that happened, by the state's own assessment, we were 34 deputies short that they never fund. So our goal was to increase revenues and decrease cost, help the city in meeting the budget shortfall. <coughs> And the overall goal, we want to make all our operations, not just jail operations, as light on the back of the taxpayer as we possibly could without compromising safety and security. Because the safety and security and the protection of you is the overriding goal. That's the whole reason we exist. So we didn't ever want to take a chance that compromises you, but still wanted to obtain these goals. So the first thing we looked at is how to increase revenues. And this is something a little unique to the sheriff's office, but it can happen in other parts of city government. We're a special revenue fund. We're not a general revenue fund. And that means that we can make money. We're also authorized by the state to do things that make money. And one of the things we can do is operate a commissary, which is we sell things. And if we're specifically authorized by the state, that sheriffs can do that. And what we sell are things mostly to the inmates, inmate canteen, care mart, and fresh favorites. And I'll talk about them all in a minute. Now the first thing was the canteen. When we got over there, we took a look and we did an analysis of our canteen. And Ken, Ken let me run with this, and I was pleased about it. And what we looked at was we had a private contractor running our canteen. We were getting about $190,000 profit out of it, which we used to run the jail. We felt we could do it better ourselves, and so we started doing it ourselves. And what we did was we hired some part-time people to oversee it, then we got a bunch of inmates in there to help us run it, because we use a lot of inmate labor. 
And right now, our canteen is projected to generate about $300,000 in profit from the canteen. It's probably going to be more than that, but that's a conservative estimate on what we're doing. Now, the money from the canteen can be used for a variety of projects, but it's mostly used for things of benefit to the inmates. That's what we buy their TVs from. That's when they take the GED exam. So it's things for benefit of the inmates. But it's, if we didn't have that money to do it, some of these things are mandated by law. That would mean we'd have to come to you with our hand out for tax money for these things. So we're funding a lot of this stuff by money we generate ourselves. And this was probably the best example I can use. Why do these revenues go up so much? One is because we really listen to what the inmates will buy. We're very nimble about that. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our health service providers, one of our nurses, we give them a slipper, and they don't like the slipper. It's just a cheap slipper. We give them a shower slipper. None of the inmates like it. So they go up to medical, and they always try to complain they have foot problems, which would get them a medical prescription for a thing that sort of looks like a croc. It's not really one of those crocs, but it looks like it. And of course, if they have a foot problem, they get them. Well, the nurse comes to us and says, you know, so many of them are coming up here and trying to game us into getting these things. You probably ought to sell them. So we looked at it and we said, you're right. So we found an install, a version of the croc. We put them on. We sell thousands of dollars worth of those things to the inmates now. I would say that probably 30% of the inmates have these things now that they buy and we make money on, and it saves you money. Also, medical's happy because now they're not coming up and trying to game the system and get out of that. So that gives you an example of how we were able to do that. We're very nimble now when it comes to seizing opportunities that present themselves through inmate canteens. We also looked at a new program called CareMark, and this is part of inmate canteen. What happens here is you can go online if you have a loved one in the jail. You can go online and you can buy products for your loved one and we'll deliver them to them. And what this answered was a complaint we had from a lot of people who had loved ones in the jail. They would send them money for canteen and then they find out they'd spend all the money calling their girlfriend, who the parent really didn't like anyway, and then they'd want more money. Well, the parent's upset because they're like, hey, I gave them $200 and he didn't buy anything that I wanted him to buy. And we would say, well, once you give him that money, it's his. There's nothing we can do about it. If he wants to spend it all on stuff that you don't think is very important, there's nothing we can do about it. So this now says, well, you can buy the stuff for him, and we'll deliver it. So if you're a little worried about what he's doing with his money, not a problem. We'll do it. And this has increased our sales into uh, the canteen, too. This is all done online. It's all done electronically. So it's really efficient in how to do. And we're constantly changing these packet items. We're always looking to see what people want. Even at Christmas time, we have the Christmas packets they could send. At Valentine's Day, we had a Valentine's Day pack. So people would buy that, and they'd send it to the inmates. It has two good things for it, too. One is, it lets the inmate know that their loved one still cares about them. Even though they did wrong, and that helps them behave while they're in the jail, which makes it safe for my deputies, because they it releases some of the tensions that they have. The other reason is, in order to get any of this stuff, you have to behave. If you don't behave, you can't have it. And they want this. So it moderates behavior. It makes it safer for my deputies who have to work with them. So it has a lot of, it's not just about the money. It has a lot of other benefits to it. And the last thing that we did was a thing called Fresh Favors. And this was, once a week, if they're good, an inmate can buy a nice meal from the staff kitchen, and we charge them restaurant prices, $8.99, $9.99, depends on what they buy. It's usually a hamburger, a fries, and a Coke. Now, in the jail, they never get a soda, ever. We feed them with fruit juice. So that's a big deal to them. They never get French fries, ever. So that's a big deal to them. And they never get meat that's actually meat. So that's a big deal to them. <laughs> <laughs> We started it in December. So far, it's made over $50,000, and that includes the startup cost, because this year was going to be the least profitable. But once again, this moderates behavior. If you don't behave, you can't have this. So they want this. So one of the strategies that we started developing here was, you know, managing 1,400 inmates is all about offering learning. 
you know, reward punishment. You do good, you get rewarded. You do bad, you get punished. We have punishment for them. We have, we'll show you that in the next month. They go to a isolation cell that they stay in, and every three days we let them out to take a shower. If they're real bad and predatory, that's what happens to them if they're really bad. But what we started looking at is, instead of giving them stuff on your dime when they're good, why don't we let them buy things that they want when they're good on their dime? And that's what we're looking for now. Instead of you giving them stuff to make them behave, we're going to let them buy stuff that they want so they'll behave. So that's kind of developed as one of the targets that's coming out of this, is we're looking for ways to reward them by letting them buy things that they want, as opposed to you giving them things on your dime. We also got into advertising. We used to, and we used to not do this, and this wasn't really ours, but we started doing it. And the biggest thing we did was the former sheriff, Paul Antain, started video advertising in the jail. We have a rolling PowerPoint. And it has ads on it. And the people pay us $1,000 a year to have one of those ads. And who do you think will advertise to inmates? Well, bondsmen, <laughs> lawyers, <laughs> marriage counselors, <laughs> people who give driving clinics for people with DUIs. So actually, it's about $130,000 that we're earning out of this so far. And then talked on that, one of our deputies came to us, Deputy Lawrence, who works in uh, Intech. He goes, you know, we ought to expand that. We have to give the inmates a rule book every year that we print up at about $17,000 a year. We print it four times a year. It costs about seventeen grand to print all year. By law, we have to give the inmates a rule book. So he said, why don't you sell advertising space in the rule book? So it seemed like a good idea. We did a market analysis. We based, we looked at magazines with a circulation like ours, how many do we hand out every year, that's the circulation. And we structured the advertising rates based on that. And then we had an auction for the pages everyone wants, inside the front page, the back page, and inside the back page. Our first printing, we generated $17,000 in revenue selling ad space. That means that we've paid for the cost of printing this book for the rest of the year. You're not paying for it anymore. We made $2,000 and we've got three printings to go. Now those next three printings, we probably won't make $17,000 a year because the people that paid a lot of money for those front pages got a year deal. That was part of the deal we gave. But we'll probably make another three or $4,000 each time we print this book now. So not only are you not paying for it anymore, we got people willingly giving us money to pay for it. We're actually making money on it that we rolled over into jail operations. The other thing that we did is we really started trying to keep state and federal inmates. In Virginia, the flexibility in the correctional system is locally. It's at the jails. It's not at the prisons. Prisons cannot be overcrowded. Jails can be. Our jail is designed for 820 inmates. We can probably hold 1,600. Start getting above those numbers, the violence starts peaking because it gets overcrowded. And really, when you run into jail, that's what you look for, is you look for how the violence is peaking. When we had a third of our facility closed when I came on uh, from the police department, the violence was way high because we had 1,600 inmates and a third of the place was closed for renovation. As soon as we open it back up, the violence goes right back down again. So it tells you that's what we look for. If we ever come to you and say we need to build more jail space, it's because the violence in the jail is peaking due to overcrowding. And we have an obligation as the city to make it as safe as we can for the deputies. And I have an obligation to do that, and so do you. But when we come to you, that's what we're talking about, that the violence is going on. We make about $2,400 in helping the state out by holding some of their inmates for them a day. So that's not bad money. We also get $64 a day in holding federal inmates. The federal system has no jails. It has no place to hold pre-convicted inmates. They contract with local jails to hold. Our most recent celebrities were the Somali pirates. As near as I can tell, it's the first time we held pirates since 1706. And now they're all gone because they've all pled guilty. But the jail, the feds came to us and contracted. Right now we're holding about 20 a day. We'd like to increase this uh, because we can make money on it, which will offset the cost for you. Now it's tax money, that's true. But 
if I can bring it here and help you out, I think that's what we should be doing because the Fed is looking for places to house inmates. So why not here and lower the cost to you at least of housing inmates? Next one we're looking at, and this is still an experiment, is the work farm. Uh, if you go out to the courthouse, you'll see about a third of an acre right now, and the inmates are growing vegetables. That's the experimental garden. That's where we're trying out to see what grows and what doesn't grow. We're about to put almost 10 acres under cultivation for a fall planting uh, off of uh, Elbow Road. And eventually we want to, if we can, we want to develop this into that the inmates will be growing their own vegetables here. We won't be buying them. And one of the clever things we did was in our food contract that we just signed that we'll talk about later on. The food contractor agrees to buy vegetables from us, provided that we grow what he wants, because there's certain vegetables they want and they don't want. And two, we won't charge them any more than what they're paying now. So we'll say, so long as it's at the price that you're getting and it's stuff you want, you have to buy it from us and it's part of the contract. He's agreed to do that. We're not quite there yet because we're still learning. Agribusiness used to be very common in jails and it's not anymore. But I think in the next year or so, we're gonna get this up and running. And that's going to save you a bunch of money, especially even if just during the summer we can provide the vegetables. It's going to save a bunch of money. And a cutting cost. Several things happened to cut the cost. We did have to reduce books. We did have to reduce our staff. We signed some new contracts, and then we innovated with some services. We're reducing our staff, we're short ten deputies over what we had before the cuts began. That's about five hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Now, that's the old-fashioned method of doing things in government, and it does happen still. But there comes a time when you can't keep doing this. You know, I need a certain number of deputies to work in the jail. There's 1,400. They're mostly felons in there. You know, I can't have 10 people doing that. I have to have a staff. So one of the things about cutting costs that you have to be careful of is eventually you're starting to cut into the bone. And I think we're at that point now. You know, my deputies deserve to work in a place that they know they have backup. And I don't think there's anybody here that wouldn't agree with that. They deserve to work in a facility that's as safe as it can be, considering what they do. And I don't think anybody will disagree with that. And by the way, that's uh, Ramos. Remember the guy that he's the guy that uh, killed those two girls, the, the drunk, the illegal, who was drunk. That's him there. He actually wasn't. He was a model prisoner, unlike uh, Philip Bay, who was the Lansdowne bomber. You know, we had the DC sniper here. You know, we have dangerous people in here, so we got to have this properly staffed so that it can be safe. So the first thing we did was we signed a new medical contract. I've done an analysis of this. It's saving about twenty thousand dollars each month over the old contract. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but that's not bad. One of the other things that I got to do was I have some friends over at the Chesapeake Sheriff's Office, and they have a dialysis machine. We don't. What we were doing in the past, when somebody had to go to dialysis, two deputies would check them out. they take them down to a dialysis place. They'd stay with them for three to six hours while he got dialysis, and then they'd bring them back. There were times in our budget where the cost of dialysis, which once it reaches a certain cap, above the medical contract we have to pay, you have to pay, was over $100,000 a year. Well, so we went to Chesapeake, we both had the same medical provider, and worked out a deal. Now when we have dialysis patients, we just send them to Chesapeake and they stay there. Chesapeake agrees to hold them, it's called a courtesy hold. Chesapeake provides the dialysis because the machine's already there and it's not being used at capacity. So they say, you can have the excess capacity. It doesn't cost them any more money. All we had to agree to is we'll buy the medicines. We haven't had a single patient go over their medical cap since we've done that. And that's really thinking. And that's just an agreement. And this is some of the nimbleness that I was talking to you about. You have to be on the lookout for things like that. Yeah. Now, what's Chesapeake get out of that? Well, we agree to take some of their inmates, too. When they have inmates they can't keep in their jail for whatever reason, we're there for them. So we work together on this. They're not really paying any money. You know, their taxpayers are fine. They're not being hurt. 
and we're saving money. Actually, so are they because they're doing dialysis themselves. So we don't have an inmate out in the public, and that's a risk. We're not paying a lot of money for it. And I'm not tying up two deputies who could be doing something else while this guy's getting his dialysis. So it's a win-win for everybody. Cutting the cost of our food service. Now, this was a contract I did work on. Actually, this was mine. We serve three meals a day. We usually have about 1,400 inmates. That's a lot of food. Two meals on weekends. What I did was went into the RFP, the request for proposal, and I took everything out that we had in there except for this. I said I wanted the food to meet the state minimums for food. Whatever the Department of Corrections said it had to be, that's what I wanted. I also told them, since this could happen, you can feed the female inmates little, littler amounts if you want it. A female needs about 2,000 calories a day. Uh, a man leaving the sedentary lifestyle of jail needs about 2,700 calories a day. Our previous contractor fed everybody 2,700 calories. We told them, you don't have to do that. If you want to feed the females less, I'm good with that. I told them they could give them water if they wanted in lieu of a juke drink. I said, you can do anything. All I want is a product out the other end that meets the state standards and let them go. Well, we got a new contract. It was a company called Catering by Marlin. We save $1,000 every day for the life of that contract over the old contract, every day. 365 days a year, we're saving you over $1,000 on the old contract, and it's a five-year deal. So that's going to save a significant amount of money. It's going to save about $370,000, probably a little more than that, because you know the amount of savings is based on the inmates. It went from $1.4.9 per meal to $78.9 per meal, and that's a real savings. We unleashed a bunch of real hungry private contractors. And we gave them a lot of authority. By the way, none of them took me up on the offer for water. And I couldn't understand why. So I asked them, why don't you want to serve them water? And they came back. The cheapest way to get an inmate certain vitamins that they have to have is through a fortified drink. So I learned. This is another one that I'm really proud of. This is the only thing I ever suggested to the General Assembly that actually got enacted into law, and I've been in law enforcement 33 years. Graffiti abatement. Graffiti is a problem, but it's a problem you can manage if you get it gone quick. That's the whole key thing with graffiti. If you let it stay there, it encourages others to put it up, and the next thing you know, the whole city looks like crap because it encourages bad behavior. So the city had a policy of they're going to go after the graffiti rapidly and quickly. It's never going to be around very long. Unfortunately, on private property, that meant the homeowner, who's the victim of this crime, now has to pay to get the graffiti removed. So we got the law changed that said we can use workforce on private property for graffiti abatement. Because prior to that, you can never use inmate labor on private property. So the law changed. They said, all right, that's one exception just for that. So now what happens is the city comes to the victim of the crime and says, you can get rid of this yourself, or if you want, we can have inmates do it under guard from the sheriff's office. Your choice. You know, the citizen gets to pick. Now, the guys, we get out there, we don't just paint it over and make it look uglier than what it was. We'll even match the paint. If you got the paint that matches the wall, that's fine, give it to us, we'll put it on there. Because now I'm not spending your money and now their wall looks better. We have, uh, they gave us a power washer so we'll get it off the, the fences and everything. Can we get this really quick? Last year it's just over $7,500 in savings. Uh, one year it was 10,000, some years it's as high as 20, although we haven't reset recently. Which I think is a good thing because I think it means we're starting to lift the graffiti problem, at least in this city. But, once again, that's a direct savings to you. That was money you were paying for that you're not now. And it helps the citizens out who were victims of the crime. If they're willing to let inmates under guard clean their stuff up, and many of them are, it doesn't cost them any more money. We don't victimize them again. And, of course, our workforce is another big part of cost cutting. We can do uh, some things for free, some things cost about 70 or 80 percent of what private contractors can do. We do paint the jail ourselves. That's about a million dollar project. We paint the jail like a bridge. You can actually mark time by what we're painting. 
We start new sections. When we finish them all, we start over again. Private contractors, $800,000 to a million. That's free. We have them do it. We do all the tile work in there. We do a lot of the minor repairs. Uh, we clean the uh, corporate landing. has that pretty fountain. Yeah, well, once a year, they have to drain that. Somebody has to come in and clean all the duck poop out of it. And that's what the inmates do. And that's probably about a $50,000 a year job. So we're looking to maximize this workforce even more. And I'll show you some of the directions we're thinking about <coughs> in a minute. We're also trying to maximize the use of our weekend workforce. We have about 200 people that come to us and serve their time just on weekends. The courts have looked at them and decided it's okay to leave them out there, so they do. And we get them doing all sorts of stuff. They were cleaning all the trash trucks. There was a $30,000 a year contract to clean trash trucks, and we took it over for a while. We were doing it for free. Uh, the city also is getting ready to start really helping out and cleaning out the ditches again. They need some laborers. We've worked with them and said, we will give you six inmates who will do the, the digging part. You know, we can give anybody a shovel. So when you start seeing those crews out there, yeah, heavy equipment operators are city employees. All the guys with the shovels, they're weekenders who are paying you back for the crime they commit. So we're really going to look at that even more. And we've got some other things in the work. Uh, another thing we offer is we do document destruction. We have a paper grinder that's as good as what the state has. And we offer this to all city agencies. We say, we'll, doc we'll destroy your documents for free. Uh, I think I saw the city treasurer here. Well, kudos to him, because he's one of the ones that takes advantage of it, and we grind up his documents for free. It doesn't cost you any money. The inmates never touch these documents. They come in sealed boxes. They're placed under camera next to the grinder, and then I take a light-duty deputy, or a full-duty deputy, usually a light-duty one, and they go out and just feed these all things through. Then we recycle paper. We take all the old books from the library. We get a lot of their books that have outlived their useful lifespan. They give them to us. They don't just throw them out. We shred them, sell it for scrap paper. Don't make a lot of money on the scrap yet, but make some. And of course, we do all of our document destruction too. Uh, a couple of state agencies use this, but it's open to the city, and we're always willing to do that. We do debt offset collections. Anybody leaves the jail owing us any money over about 100 bucks, we sue them. And then we get a judgment against them. And then what happens is if they ever get a lottery winning or an income tax check back from the state, we have our hand out to get your money back. We collect about 22%. Now we're getting ready to do enhanced collections. And this came from the guy who was running the program. He's a civilian. He's a part-time civilian. He said, you know, the state, when you owe the state money, they do a lot more to get the money back. They'll suspend your driver's license, and they'll give it over to a debt collector to go after you. We don't do that because the law doesn't allow it because our debt is not considered debt of the commonwealth yet. It's considered debt of the sheriff's office. So now we're trying to get the law changed that if you owe us any money, you can get your license suspended, just like if you owe debt to any part of the commonwealth. Anymore. And we think, just like when the commonwealth did that, it's going to increase the collection. The other thing that we do is civil law enforcement. This is one of those blended things. Private industry does it. We do it. We make about six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars a year. This is really good because we compete directly with private industry for this, and competition breeds efficiency. We just added on a uh, electronic system that you can now track your subpoena. When you give something to us, you can go online and. You can say, this is the subpoena I got or the writ, and we'll tell you exactly where it is in our process now. And we're getting ready to make it that we'll send you an email alert when we serve it so that you'll know, you know. Now, that may not be a big deal to one person, but if you're an apartment manager with a thousand apartments and you're trying to evict two or three hundred people or a hundred people, that kind of stuff they like. So we use that to attract them to come to us <laughs> as opposed to the private services. Another one that we work for is to increase jail industry. What, what we're defining as jail industry is, you know, we're going to reach a point where we're not comfortable putting any more inmates out in the public. You know, we're strict on who we put out there. And, but we're real comfortable with having inmates work inside the walls. And we use them a lot. But some of the things we are looking at in the jail industries and all that, of course, the workforce garden we talked about, we might be able to do animal control, become the animal caretakers at the new shelter. 
just have inmates do that. I approached them and said, if you want to do that, I'd like it to be a training program too, so that the people who do this come out with a certificate or something that says, I know how to do manage an animal shelter, or care and feeding of animals, so that maybe they can get a job in the real world. Uh, we're also looking at a printing press. We've approached the city, you know, the city's looking about what to do with printing because it's getting too expensive. And we're saying, well, you know, if we made it a training program, maybe we could do printing. And once again, we'd make it a training program. And then when they leave, they have a certificate that says, hey, I know how to do high-speed printing. I knew how to do dead offset printing. And maybe they can get a job when they get out. But if, if nothing else happens, at least I can save you a bunch of money. Because I won't be paying any labor costs if we start doing this stuff. So our conclusion really is we want to meet the obligations to Virginia Beach. But I think the key thing you see, and this is really the key, is the organization, you have to set it up so that ideas come from everywhere. They come from within, they come from without, they come from above, they come from below. And that's really the key on how to make this stuff work. And that's what we encourage within our organization, for that to happen. You know, and you know, there's great people working in the office. You just gotta, you know, give them a mission, get out of their way, and they'll surprise you with the results, to paraphrase Pat. Any questions? Wow. Let, me, uh, let me start right here. Let me start right here. Hi. Earlier you said that uh, inmates can be rewarded by being able to buy things. And How do you measure inmate behavior? We keep track of everything they do. Assaults, failure to obey orders, fighting with other inmates, uh, not taking their medicine, do they take the GED program or, or are they just in there disrupting classes? We measure everything internally through, in, through incident reports on inmates. And that's how we measure what it is. And then every year we do an analysis of that. Now, you know, I mean, on their best day, they're inmates. <laughs> and many of them are in there because they don't know how to solve problems without violence. And that's what gets them in there. So will we ever get it down to zero? No. But we've got a number of strategies in place. When we get the violent inmate we can't control now, he goes to C3F, our supermax wing, where he sits by himself. He doesn't have any, he's shackled every time he comes out. Even when he gets his shower once every three days, he's shackled to the shower so we don't have to fight with him anymore. So, you know, we do have some of them that we can do nothing with.